It's great to have you here. And so um, I'm a professor and I always like at the top of um, my presentations to give kind of a roadmap of where we're going. So uh, I am going to be talking about my uh, book and the history behind the book. And so um, before I go into sort of a PowerPoint with like slides and information, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the book and then just read a tiny bit because I think if um, like Joan, you've already read the book, then um, you probably would keep up no problem. But if you haven't yet had the chance to read the book, it might help to have some background. So um, my uh, most recent book before this one um, was Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. So I figured I would just show that too. Um, because like in Lillian, I've taken uh, two historical figures and kind of uh, retold their story in this fictionalized version. And so the, the two characters of this book are Shara Me and Major Whittlesey, and it's based on true events of World War I. And so I think all you need to know right now, because a lot of it will come up in the you know, official talk part, Sheremy was a pigeon, as you can see by the image on the cover, um, and Major Whittlesey was a U.S. Army soldier, and their lives intersected in the very first few days of October of 1918 in the Meuse-Argonne Forest, um, where they were sort of at the front of the line, and they you know, were told in this advance to you know, kind of charge until the last man dropped, that everyone all along the line was going to get through. Um, but it turned out that only this particular group of soldiers with this particular pigeon um, made it through and that led to a lot of problems and a lot of consequences. So I will cover all that more in depth in the talk. But I think the other thing you need to sort of know about the book is that it goes alternating point of view. So you take turns hearing from Jeremy and then from Whittlesey and they go back and forth and they're both first person. Um, and one of the things I like about fiction is it has that um, magical capacity to embody perspectives unlike our own. And so it is in first person pigeon uh, and it is in first person soldier. I've, I've never been a pigeon and I've never been um, a World War I soldier, but I took it upon myself to sort of inhabit those points of view. And so it's not a reading. Um, don't worry, I won't read too much, but I think I'm just gonna read like the first page um, of each of the first chapters. So like the first chapter, chapter one, you hear from Cher Ami, and then chapter two, it sort of starts over again um, and you're hearing from Charles Whittlesey. And so I just wanted you to hear a little bit of that and then we'll go into the slides. So chapter one, share on me. Monuments matter most to pigeons and soldiers. I myself have become a monument, a feathered statue inside a glass case. In life, I was both a pigeon and a soldier. In death, I am a piece of mediocre taxidermy collecting dust in the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. The museum has closed and everyone has gone home. The last guests took their leave at 5.30 as they do every weekday, and even the janitorial staffers have finished their tasks, miles of floors polished and pine scented, acres of displays gleaming and silent. A few hours remain before midnight. This is the eve of the 100 year anniversary of what, according to the United States Army, was the most important day of my avian life, October 4th, 1918. I'm not sure I agree. That day was an important one, certainly, but days don't carry the same meaning for pigeons as they do for humans, and my life comprised other days, days that might be equally worth note, if not to the Army, then at least to me and to those I loved. Pigeons can love. Pigeons cannot fight. Yet I was once as well known to school children and grown up citizens alike as any human hero of what was then called the Great War. Hence the stuffing of my mangled body. Hence my enshrinement here in the grandmother's attic of the entire country. So um, I'll stop there, uh, but I think you, know, you kind of get the idea that this is all uh, first person pigeon, but it's also pigeon from beyond the grave. And so um, this really is true, Sherami uh, is, housed, such as it is, um, in the Smithsonian. It's her taxidermy body, so she's really there. Uh, some of you may have had the pleasure of going to see her. If not, I recommend it, you know, after it's safe to go when hopefully the pandemic is done. Um, but she's actually in there, and I'll talk a little bit about that further on in the talk. But I will also say that um, if you have questions, um, the chat, which is already full of great banter, um, would be a place where you could feel free to, um, if you want to type them in as we go, I'll get to them at the end, but if that helps you not forget them as we're going, 
that would be great. Or um, this is a small enough group, right, that um, I think you could, if you wanted to, um, you know, at the end, actually speak, like unmute your mic and turn on your camera and ask your question that way, if that's your, your thing. So uh, now a little bit from chapter two, which is where we hear from Charles Whittlesey. Monuments matter most to pigeons and soldiers. Some matter more than others. None matter more to me than the Soldiers and Sailors Monument on Riverside Drive on the Upper West Side. It's not a monument for my war, the Great War, the war that has caused me to be known these past three years as Go to Hell Whittlesey, heroic commander of the Lost Battalion. Instead, it's white marble gleams for the Union Army, which won the Civil War almost 60 years ago. The Soldiers and Sailors Monument has a personal significance for me, one that has nothing to do with war. It's where I, fresh from Harvard Law School, naive and lonesome, met the man who would be my entree into the double life I led until I chose to let the war interrupt it. My thoughts keep returning to it tonight, though Marguerite and I are currently a couple of miles away, walking from the Rivoli Movie Palace on Broadway toward her midtown apartment. The November breeze blows chill and damp. I'm wearing my best fall jacket, which feels a bit ostentatious. It's already discomforting that the Rivoli's ushers invariably make a show of recognizing me. But Marguerite likes the pomp of seeing a film there, the spectacle of the other moviegoers who pack the Greek Revival building being as interesting to her as anything on the screen. She works in advertising, and even on her weekends, she harbors a professional interest in human behavior. Knowing better than to apply her gimlet amateur psychologist's eye to me, she has to exert her analytic capacity on strangers. I enjoy the program of musicians, soloists, organ and orchestra who accompany the movies there. Enjoy turning invisible for a while in the darkness, no one asking for stories of the front in France. And so I'll stop there. Um, so I think, um, that sort of gives you an idea of how the structure goes and probably you noticed that like the first sentence of each chapter um, repeated each other and so um, I'm definitely going through this story and sort of offering the perspective of two different beings so you do get to hear about sort of the same material but from different perspectives. So um, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen here. So I've, I've made this PowerPoint, like I said before, this is um, I love teaching and I love PowerPoint, so this was super fun to make, but this is the first time. This is like a world PowerPoint premiere. So thank you all for being here for this. I hope you love it. Um, so here we go. Let's share the screen. Share screen. All right. I'll give it a second to show up. Can you guys see it? Yes, awesome. All right, so um, if anyone can't see it, let me know, but it, it sounds like we're all good. So this PowerPoint is called Above the Trenches and In Them, the Real Life Pigeon and Soldier Who Inspired Cher Ami and Major Whittlesey. And as you can see, there's, you know, the slides down. If I can interrupt for one second, yeah. we're seeing your whole screen with, um, you know, all of the little doodads. I think maybe if you do slideshow, Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, and then we'll just see the images. Yes. There you go. Very right? perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so as you can see, these are um, the two, you know, real people, and I'm going to just go ahead and call them people. I know, obviously, that Sharon Me is a pigeon, but I think, um, I'm not calling her human, but I do think we can extend personhood to animals, um, especially I think those of us with pets. I see a cat, Nicole. I mean, like, I think, you know, those of us who live with and love animals know they have personalities. Um, so that's why I say uh, people. So, um, you know, ever since I was a, a kid, I've been really fascinated with um, World War I. And I start here because I think, um, you know, one of the questions that you always get asked as a novelist is, where do you get your ideas? And so I'm going to answer that question, but I think um, the where do you get your ideas question kind of strikes a balance, at least for me, of stuff that's internal and stuff that's external. And I think, you know, you can sometimes get ideas from outside, but in order for those ideas to really take root, they have to hit something or sort of land on fertile ground, you know, within to take root and grow into a story. So to put it another way, 
I love history. I love the detective work of archives and, and the historian. But as you can tell, I, I've only written three novels so far, so I don't write novels about every single thing, every single idea that crosses my transom. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is sort of build up to where like the specific idea for this came from by talking about some inherent interests that were kind of in me already um, that this outside idea set free and that eventually became this novel. So that is why I begin with my lifelong fascination with World War I. Um, and so, you know, I think I'm going to start with just some of these numbers. I know numbers can quickly make us glaze over and they can be hard for the mind to wrap around, but I do think the numbers of World War I speak to part of why I've always been drawn to it. And so um, the total number of military and civilian casualties, as you can see, ended up being over 40 million. Um, and then 20 million of those were deaths and 20 million, 21 million of those were wounded. Um, and so the deaths broke down, and I think this is really key to this conflict, to 9.7 million military personnel and 10 million civilians. So more civilians, more non-combatants and non-participants um, lost their lives in this conflict than military personnel. And I think that's one of the reasons this war was such a game changer. It was like the first, you know, we call it a world war now. They called it the Great War at the time. but just like the annihilating totality of it was something that hadn't really been encountered by humans prior. Um, and so then something specifically about trench warfare itself, just that specific absurd futility and butchery um, really haunted me. And I think just to kind of pause there, I just remember hearing about it as a kid and, and you know, those of you who've studied this know like trench warfare really was horrible. Like you'd be in these trenches filled with mud, filled with rats, filled with body lice, filled with rain, you know, getting gangrene, not able to keep warm. And that was just when you weren't fighting. And then somebody would blow a whistle or fire a pistol and you'd go over the top and just charge out into no man's land. And there you would be greeted by possibly landmines, almost assuredly barbed wire, maybe tanks, definitely machine guns. And you would just do this over and over again with you know, millions of people dying around you. And I think just the fact that people came up with that and then consented to do it, I still have a hard time understanding how that happened, which is part of why I eventually had to write a novel about it. So, new slide. Um, my own dad uh, was in the military, and so we had tons of military history book around the house, and he also often taught classes on military history, so it was something, you know, we'd see him practicing, giving his lessons, um, and so I think I became interested in this particular war partly out of uh, knowing that my dad was a soldier of a very, you know, different kind in a very different era, and also that he taught about this. And then, I don't know, I can't see everyone's face right now because of uh, the, the screen share, but I don't know if anyone else watched um, the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. <laughs> Drop me a note in the chat if you did, because it was this um, very short-lived, I imagine extremely expensive to produce um, TV show that, that only aired from 1992 to 1993. But as you can see here, um, it had Young Indiana Jones choosing to go off and fight um, in World War I, and it depicted him as having the experience that many people did, which is he thought it would be this big fun adventure, this almost like lark or joke, and then finding out that it was actually, you know, incredibly terrible and miserable beyond all imagining. Um, and then a more highbrow uh, thing that I was, you know, drawn to a little bit later in my youth was World War I poetry. It was an extremely literate um, and literary war in some quarters um, because it was a conflict where not only did you certainly have, you know, the working class participating and being forced, you know, through the draft to participate, but you also had a lot of um, upper middle um, to even almost aristocratic classes participating. And of course, these men would have been very well educated. And as a result, at least on the Western front, you have this huge written record of, of poetry and novels and memoirs. Um, people like Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, Edward Thomas, Robert Graves, um, documenting their experiences, usually very critically. And to that end, um, I love poetry. I'm a poet. Um, a couple people who are here, um, Jennifer and Eric, are, are part of Poems While You Wait, so shout out to my poets. 
Um, but I just wanted to share one of the poems because this this all goes to you know where I got my idea. This is something that I just kind of um, like and I'm interested in. So this is a, a poem called Rain by Edward Thomas. And as you can see, he was killed um, in 1917 in the Battle of Arras. And so this is maybe my favorite World War I poem. I don't know, there's so many contenders, but I love this one. So I'm just gonna read it quickly. Rain, midnight rain, nothing but the wild rain on this bleak hut and solitude and me, remembering again that I shall die and neither hear the rain nor give it thanks for washing me cleaner than I have been since I was born into this solitude. Blessed are the dead that the rain rains upon. But here I pray that none whom I once loved is dying tonight or lying still awake, solitary, listening to the rain, either in pain or thus in sympathy, helpless among the living and the dead, like a cold water among broken reeds, myriads of broken reeds, all still and stiff, like me, who have no love which this wild rain has not dissolved, except the love of death, if love it be towards what is perfect and cannot, the tempest tells me, disappoint. Um, and I just think, I don't know, I just love that, that poem. But this next slide, um, to bring it a little closer to home, um, in addition to sort of, you know, being fascinated by these shows and these poems, um, my own dad was a member of American Legion Post 80, which you can see on the screen. It's in Downers Grove. Um, he's a beekeeper and a gardener, and they have a lot of land out there, so he does that. But if you go into that building, right through the glass doors that are pictured there, you see the namesake, um, A.B. Burns, as his picture is displayed there. Um, and his full name was Alexander Bradley Burns, and he was he's the namesake of this post because he went to Downers Grove North High School. I don't know if anybody else went there or knows it, but um, go Trojans. Um, but I remember as a kid, you know, when we'd go there for like bingo or other events, looking and looking at this photograph because it's hanging on the wall right after you walk in and seeing how, as you can tell, just how young um, he was, the intensity of his stare. He's, he's clearly someone who is sort of supposed to be at the start of his life. But, you know, when you read the website or you read the placard, you see that it says he was the first of our boys from Downers Grove to make the supreme sacrifice killed by shrapnel on March 12th, 1918. And I remember getting obsessed with him um, and digging more and it just, you know, killed by shrapnel makes it sound really neat and quick, but it actually wasn't. He was, I won't get too graphic and gruesome, but it took him a while to die. I mean, the, the way that people died in this war were often very terrible. So he was hit a bunch of times. They tried to save him. They couldn't save him. It turned septic. He died. So I, I just kept thinking, especially when I was like freshly out of high school myself, about what that would mean and how that would feel to die um, so young. And then another lifelong uh, fascination is birds. I love birds. I know many people love birds, especially during the pandemic. Bird watching has been a comfort to a lot of us. So I love all the, you know, the fun, fancy birds that you can see. You know, I love it when like the scarlet tanagers are migrating and you see them. But my favorite bird um, is the is the pigeon, and it, I think as it says here, is because I grew up mostly in small towns and the suburbs. But anytime I went into the city. I admired pigeons and I think, you know, being around pigeons is a sign of urbanity and being in this kind of high density place because pigeons tend to live where people live and to coexist closely with them. Um, and so as you can see here, I, I think they're beautiful. I know people like to call them rats with wings, but I think that's really a disservice to both rats and pigeons. Um, and so I think, you know, looking back as I was putting this talk together, I think one of the things that really reassured me in my love of pigeons was Mary Poppins, uh, probably other Mary Poppins fans there. Um, but specifically, as you can see here, this um, Feed the Birds, that, you know, kind of showstopper number, right, where Julie Andrews as Mary takes the snow globe and shakes it, and inside it is this um, woman who sits outside St. Paul's Cathedral and sells bird feed for tuppence a bag, and I just, I, I love that scene. And, I thought about playing it for you, but you can all, you all have YouTube, we're all sitting on our computers all the time. So go watch it again if you haven't in a while. It's, it's really beautiful. And then here's me with pigeons. Um, <laughs> I really like pigeons. Um, this is a photo shoot that I did uh, last summer in August down in 
Daily Plaza. And so this is me and some of my feathered friends. And I just, I think, you know, pigeons are so, uh, they're so tame. It's so easy if you just hold out food for them to come and, and want to be by you because, you know, the pigeons in cities are domestic pigeons that have turned feral again. So I think if, you know, you've ever been struck by how bold pigeons are, that's part of it. They're used to us. So all that, right, you've got these two threads, these two strains of like pre-existing things that were in my head kind of coming together. And so the first is my lifelong fascination with World War I, and then the second is, of course, um, pigeons. The catalyst that really, um, I think maybe it's like Okay. Um, I, so they came together because I had this uh, encounter in the classroom. I teach at DePaul University, which is pictured here. We're all remote this quarter, so I'm, I'm sad to not be on campus. But back in 2013, I was teaching a class that has connections to Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. It's called Writer as Urban Walker. And one of my students, who I always like to mention his name when I talk about this, Brian Michich, turned in this poem that contained this line that said, this was no share on me story. Um, and it was about a guy who um, was sitting on a park bench surrounded by pigeons. And then Brian said, you know, in the poem, in parentheses, look it up because I always, always tell my students to look stuff up. Um, I think, you know, there's no problem being ignorant of something, you know, not all of us know everything, but the problem comes when you have a chance to move from ignorance to knowledge and reject it, which is what you do if you see an allusion and don't look it up. So I laughed at Brian's little, little joke and I looked it up. And what I saw was um, pretty amazing. And so this, you can see here, this is um, you know, actual photographs. I think one of the things about World War I, you know, partly that led me to be fascinated by it is it was so documented. It you know, wasn't as well documented as you know, World War II or the Vietnam War, but it was because of its modernity, really well photographed and even filmed. And so, you know, all of the pictures that follow are, are real pictures. But I learned the story of the Lost Battalion. Um, and in short, you know, it was 554 soldiers who were led by Major Charles Whittlesey. Um, and it was in October of 1918. And as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, they successfully advanced during this really long, really massive battle called the Meuse Argonne. Um, in the Meuse Argonne Forest in France. And they became trapped behind German lines. And for four days, they held out with no food or water. Um, and then they became the victims of a friendly fire incident. So a little bit of background. Um, Whittlesey was this very mild-mannered, um, Harvard-educated, Wall Street lawyer, um, very much respected in his profession, very much admired by his friends but he was kind of the last person that most of them would ever have expected to be a war hero. And you can kind of see in his picture here, um, you know, he was bespectacled, you know, not to, to stereotype, but he just seemed like this bookish, almost professorial guy. And yet he turned out to be an amazing commander and that kind of was their success and unfairly their downfall. So they got this order um, and you can tell October 1918, right? That's like a month before the war was over. It was like the Americans had come and they were really, really determined to just put a stop to this conflict. And so they were told that everyone along the line was just gonna advance until they got to the Germans and that was how they were gonna win. And because it was gonna be this huge advance where everybody made it, they didn't need to take any supplies, right? No raincoats, no rain gear, no food, no water, because the idea was they would all get across um, and then they would hook up the supply trains and everything would be great and they would win the war. But that's not what happened. And so Whittlesey and his men were the only group of soldiers that entire day who fulfilled the objective. And as a result, they projected out and then they got cut off. So this incident is often referred to as the pocket because they were surrounded totally out alone ahead of everyone else. So that's why they had no supplies. But what they did have was pigeons. Um, and this is you know, an actual picture of, you can see these soldiers. Um, it's often called tossing a pigeon, but you know, they, it's mostly just like a release, like an enthusiastic release. You don't really throw them. Um, but as it sort of says here, 
as modern as World War I was, communications were a huge problem. And that's because they had, you know, telephones were invented, but the wires were very easily cut and both sides would try to cut the wires of their enemy. Um, and in fact, to go back to Alexander Bradley Burns, his death came about, um, at least as it's recorded, because he was trying to repair a phone line that had been cut. So he was out on a repair party trying to like refix the telephone line. So it was very, you know, not only impractical, it was very dangerous. And then they also had radio, but radio wasn't two way yet. They could only transmit, they couldn't receive. They were very close to that, but it wasn't ready. Um, so other than that, they relied on runners, like actually guys who just ran back and forth from the front to the rear. Uh, they had guys on motorcycles. But as you can imagine, both sides, again, tried to kill those people. And that was a very perilous job. So one of the most reliable and plentiful means of carrying messages was pigeons. And so both sides had supplies of pigeons that they used to carry notes and coordinates. Um, and so just a little bit like of, of side notes, you, you know, nothing in the slide shows this, but one of the things that both sides did was they had their snipers trained to shoot pigeons. So either side, if they saw a pigeon and were able, they would shoot the pigeon out of the air because they knew it was carrying some kind of message, which is why all the messages would usually be written in code because there was a decent chance your pigeon would get shot and captured. But also, the Germans took it to kind of a new level and they had um, falconers, trained falconers who had birds of prey whose job it was to eat the pigeons out of the sky. So, you know, pigeons were important. Both sides spent a lot of effort on, on pigeon warfare. And so Cher Ami was their last pigeon, right, to go back to the pocket. They've been in there the fifth day. They're starting to get shelled by the Americans because nobody knows exactly where they are. So, of course, the Americans in the rear were trying to shell the Germans, but their coordinates were bad. And so here's the message that Cher Ami carried, um, which says, we are, this is written by Whittlesey, we are along the road parallel, sick, he didn't spell it right, but he was under a lot of stress, uh, to 276.4. Our own artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. For heaven's sake, stop it. So she carried the message. Um, and that's kind of what, you know, my novel is about. That's sort of the climax. You get to see them going up to that point and then that point. And she succeeded. She flew 25 miles in 25 minutes, which is super fast. And thanks to her, 194 men were saved. Um, she was really badly injured. They shot her through the eye. They shot her through the chest. Um, her leg was hanging by a tendon when she made it. And the medics, saved her, which is unusual because there were so many pigeons who were used that they usually just let the pigeons die. Um, but in the case of Cher Ami, they knew that the message she carried was really crucial. So they made her a little wooden leg um, so that she could sort of hop around on it as she convalesced. And she received, and you can kind of see here with her, her medal for gallantry, um, she got the Croix de Guerre with palm oak leaf cluster, which is a big deal. Um, the French government government has a longer history of giving medals to animals than the American government. Um, so she got an unofficial medal from Pershing because that wasn't a thing the American army did. So they just sort of made up a medal for her. Um, and he saw her off, you know, back to the United States. And then meanwhile, and this is part of why I, I needed to tell the book in this alternating structure, um, Whittlesey also became very, very famous. And he, because, you know, I think something that might be easy to overlook in the synopsis is that they were, by the time they got saved, every newspaper in America was covering the lost battalion. Um, it was a war with very few opportunities for heroism, this mass butchery. And so thanks to the New York press corps, everyone back in the States was waiting with bated breath to hear what was gonna happen. And so through it all, the temptation to surrender was incredibly high. Um, many of Whittlesey's men came to him and asked, could we just quit? Could we just give up? Could we just surrender to the Germans? And he knew that for one thing, that would not necessarily guarantee any safety or freedom. They could have all been killed anyway. But for another, that would have been terrible for morale. Everyone would have heard that they gave up and that would have been really bad at this pivotal moment when you're, they didn't know it was a month away, but you're a month away from this you know, end of the war. So because he didn't surrender, 
um, he too received the Medal of Honor, the Croix de Guerre, and the Legion of Honor, and he comes back to the States and he becomes this incredibly popular speaker at Red Cross events, American Legion events, Liberty Loan Fun Drives, um, and he even starred, this is one of my favorite facts, in a movie based on the Lost Battalion. He played himself, which I think, you know, speaks to the lack of understanding of what we now know as PTSD, to like ask someone who's been through this thing to actually just do it again for a movie. It seemed kind of intense, but he did it. And sadly, here's Sheremy, you can see um, she's missing her leg. You know, that's her, her classic wound. She's here in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, where they sent her um, to kind of be a mascot. They toured her around. They showed her to school children. They showed her to wounded soldiers as sort of an example, which I think is also kind of intense when you think about it. She was kind of shown to the men who may also have lost limbs or had other terrible injuries as kind of, you know, look at this bird, she could recover, you can, you can have a normal life again too, um, which is obviously a bit of a simplification. And, you know, sadly, and this is like spoiler alert, so like stop listening if you don't wanna know what happened, um, Whittlesey also did not live long after his return to the States. And so Cherami died of natural causes, um, but Whittlesey disappeared and was almost assuredly a suicide. Um, he booked himself a one-way ticket on a ship called the Taloa, which was a United Fruit ship that had a regular route to and from Havana down in Cuba. Um, you know, it would come from New York taking tourists and it would go back up loaded with fruit. Um, so he, you know, took this tourist trip and he had just participated in the internment ceremony for the unknown soldier at Arlington. And, you know, many of his close friends think that that moment, um, that reminder was sort of the last straw. He'd been struggling for years trying to, um, you know, do everything he could in support of the army and support of other survivors, was plagued with survivor's guilt. Um, and so I think, you know, this is the thing that caused him to realize he had to take his own life or he would never get away from this. And so in his one page will, um, he left back in his law office the German um, letter demanding that they surrender, the one that he famously refused, um, to his co-commander, George McMurtry, who's also a character in the book. And he left, you know, everything in really good order. Um, and we never, you know, we didn't find his body, so because he was at sea, he just jumped, so he's in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but Cher Ami had this really embodied afterlife where you can see here, this is a picture I took. I apologize for the glare. She's behind glass. Um, they put her in the Smithsonian. She was so important that they wanted to preserve her. And I've been calling her a she this whole time, but what's fascinating, I think, is that in the papers and you know, in all the military reports, they identified her as male, partly because it's just hard to tell with pigeons, um, but also partly because she was such a hero. And I think this idea of soldiers and someone who's gonna go fight, it's usually categorized as you know, a manly activity. And so the taxidermist figured out that she was a female and had been that entire time. And that, confusion caused me to be really interested in um, using this book as a chance to think about heroism and who gets identified as a hero and who doesn't. And similarly, um, when, you know, Whittlesey disappeared, a lot was made in the newspaper accounts because this was covered, you know, when he vanished, every newspaper again, because he was so famous, covered it. Um, and it said over and over again that he was a confirmed bachelor, no woman was involved. Um, and that caused me to depict him in the novel as um, a gay man who was, you know, active but closeted in the sense that um, not necessarily that he was ashamed, but just that you couldn't be out, you couldn't be open at that time. And so I tried not to write him as some sort of tragic gay character who was tortured by this, but as someone who just, that was his identity. And so he was a gay war hero, but he couldn't talk about it. Um, and I think you can see this is, I included this enlistment poster because you can see the appeal that was at the time to this classic masculinity, right? You've got this sort of thin, effete, foppish, very well-dressed, slender gentleman on one side of the window. And he's looking out at all these like strapping, tan, hale and hearty, you know, real men, soldiers beneath this big American flag. And so, you know, at the time in the air was all this pressure to like be a real man and fight for your country. Um, so I was interested in that as well. And then my strongest, um, this is something I can't talk about in normal readings because it's, it's a bit of a spoiler, um, but my strongest reference in favor of um, 
him being gay is that one of the nine farewell letters that he left in his cabin um, was to his law partner, his former law partner, John Prynne, who was his dearest friend. And it began just a note to say goodbye. I'm a misfit by nature and by training. And there's an end of it. And you know, to refer to oneself as a misfit was at the time another one of these um, bits of coded language that you could sort of use to identify yourself as gay if you wanted to. And so, you know, many people have asked me, you know, if I were a biographer, obviously I, I don't have the smoking gun, I can't prove it. He was a very private person. He didn't leave a diary or a journal, but I feel um, that depicting him as gay was an important part of his character and true to his nature. And so I wanted to reveal this part of his identity that's not usually covered in other accounts. And I thought it echoed nicely with Cher Ami's gender confusion as well. And then the last official slide um, that I'll show before I open it up to q and I, I haven't been watching the chat, so if there's some questions in there, I'll get those, but we will have a good amount of time for, for Q&A. Um, I think I always love all of my characters. I can't write about characters I don't love, um, even if they do bad things, even if they're complicated or disappointing, I have to love them. And I loved both Sherami and Whittlesey so much. And here's a picture of Whittlesey, again, kind of going back to that Alexander Bradley Burns. He's so young here. This is him as an undergrad. I teach undergrads. Um, and you can see he's, you know, got his baby face and he's looking, you know, sort of smart, like a scholar. And in his um, yearbook, they, you know, asked all of his class what the purpose of a college education was. And in his answer, he said, the purpose of a college education is learning to judge correctly, to think clearly, and to see and to know the truth, and to attain the faculty of pure delight in the beautiful. And like, I can hardly read that without crying because like this, uh, he's just one example. I mean, like going back, you know, 10 million <laughs> men were killed fighting in this war and he's just one and, you know, all of them had this consciousness and this spark and this love and this life, and they all died. And in Whittlesey's case, he survived the war, but then he didn't, three years later, he didn't survive the war. And so, as it says here, that's where my sorrow and fascination with World War I lies, is that all those beautiful humans and animals were killed, and what for? And nobody knows. And I think, um, you know, there's hardcore armchair historians like myself who really love thinking about and learning about World War I, but most people, honestly don't care. Um, and even the best historians when pressed to say why exactly the globe just erupted in 1914 into this miasma of murder, they can point to things, but none of it makes sense and none of it's logical. And so I think um, I love history. I love objectivity. Facts are important. The truth matters. But I think for me, I like historical fiction because it gives a chance to explore some of these hugely important questions without boiling it down to any one answer, but maybe thinking about it from a variety of directions. And so I hope that if you read the book, you like it. It's not meant to, you know, teach you a lesson, but I think you'll learn. Um, and most of all, I think it'll call your attention to um, Charles Whittlesey and to Cher Ami, who are people I think we should know more about. Um, and here's my book. Um, my publisher would be annoyed if I didn't tell you that it, you know, came out on August 11th. And then also I think um, Joan put in the chat, um, Seminary Co-op, awesome Chicago bookstore, has signed copies available, both hardcover and paperback. So if you're inclined, they will definitely sell you a copy. Um, and I would encourage you to um, possibly do that. So I will um, stop the share now and come back to your your faces. And so I'll see um, what we've got in the chat. So that's my talk. So thanks for listening. Um, great. Yay. Thanks for applauding. Oh, good. And Joan put the link in again. Eric says his mom wrote the book. <laughs> Yay. Jennifer has the book. <laughs> Eric's showing his face. This is awesome. Um, thank you. So if you, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or type it in. Yeah, Bill. So, uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate your really deep understanding of how unprecedented the Great War was and how people were, in a way that our culture doesn't understand, are, were freaked out by it. So like World War I gets in the way, or I mean, World War II gets in the way of us understanding World War I. 
the bomb prevents us from understanding the machine gun. The, the death camps prevent us from understanding the, the trenches. Um, so one of the things that I do when I teach great war literature, I, I look at Hemingway and I went looking for it while you were talking and I can't find the thing, but there's a passage in Farewell to Arms where the narrator, Frederick Henry, talks about not trusting the language anymore. Like he could not understand words like sacrifice or hollow. They were obscene besides the names of like the facts. Yeah. So one of the things I most loved about this book was how you depicted the facts of the warfare that Charles Whittlesley and his men went through. Literally the shit that they went through. Um, how did you get there? Because so much of the history elides that. I'm thinking specifically of the scene where Whittlesley comes upon a, a guy who's shitting in a, the wrong place and tries to like pull up his pants and salute at the same time and can't. How did, how did you get to that point in your research? Because that's something that I've seen in no other book except maybe, uh, the, the trilogy, I'm blanking, oh my God. Uh, the Pat British Parker? Trilogy. Yeah, the Regeneration Trilogy, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I've ever seen this even mentioned and she didn't really hit it the way you did. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, you know, the research phase, those of you who, who've come to any of my talks, you know, the research phase is my favorite and I tend to spend, you know, between a year and two years just researching. And, you know, one of the books that really, Bill helped me get there was this book. It's it's really hard to find. It was self-published. It was by this guy, John Nell, N-E-L-L. -L, and it was just like a private experience. You know, you could tell it was the kind of thing that this old guy, you know, he was not, he was not one of these literate people. He was lower class. He was like from Missouri. He was like a replacement private. And it was like a late in life vanity project. But I'm so glad he published it because it was just this super frank, you know, no holds barred account of like how shitty literally and metaphorically it was to be to be a soldier in this war um and then i think you know in all the books that i read i really tried to gravitate toward this um so like to write a novel like you know as much as world war one's forgotten i'm not going to be able to say anything new about like why it happened or the geopolitical reasons or the collapse of empire or etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so I just kept gravitating toward these little stories that would really show that like granular detail of life in the trenches. Um, and I think, you know, one of the other things that I wanted to show, you know, I was struck by, I think my, my eye on animal stories really let me get to that place because there were so many accounts of men adopting animals just as a way to get over that shittiness. Like they would adopt anything. They would adopt a field mouse. They would adopt a spider. They would adopt a pig. They would adopt a cat. Adopt any animal because they were just so desperate for any sign of love and connection in the midst of this like utter hellscape that they were living in. So I think that helped me find those anecdotes. Yeah, great question. Other questions or comments? I think one of the most interesting things for me in this book was how you got into the head of a pigeon. <laughs> how did you do that? <laughs> I mean, I have no idea if you did it accurately or not, because we have no pigeons here to tell us. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Ah, thank you. Thank you. And Eric, I see your question in the chat, too, so I'll get that, too. Um, yeah, I think, you know, obviously, Joan, like, the great thing is that, you know, as much as I talked about how the men left these written records in many cases and left these very personal accounts, pigeons, as far as we know, did not, right? Pigeons, I think they have a language and they communicate, but it's not written. It's not like we humans identify it. And so I didn't have that to draw on. But what I did have to draw on is, you know, all these hundreds of years of human pigeon interaction, because that's a thing I just want to like, I'll, I'll, I'm going to sound like a crazy pigeon lady. I'm just going to go there. But Humans and pigeons have lived together lovingly for thousands of years. And so just a few highlights, right? You know, Genghis Khan set up a pigeon post to carry news from his very far, you know, East Asian empire toward um, Eastern Europe. And so that's, you know, one example. Um, Chinese emperors would do something similar because their empire was so vast. Julius Caesar used pigeons to report news of his conquest of Gaul. Um, the Greek Olympics, the ancient, ancient Olympics would use pigeons. Um, to report who won which games or who won like a marathon um, and then also in the bible 
Noah's Ark, right? I think we, we always remember the dove, but he sent a raven first and the raven just left. Like the raven just was like found land and never came back. So he sent a dove, which is a pigeon, and the pigeon is the one that came back with the proof of land. So you know, I'll pause, but you know, pigeons and humans have been together forever. So there is, while the pigeons don't leave their record, there's this rich body of literature and accounts of like how pigeons act, speculation as to why they can home. Um, and so I just did all this research and then tried to depict a pigeon consciousness in a way that I would depict any fictional character, right? Someone who had pros and cons, had good traits and bad, had loves, had losses, had desires that could be thwarted or attained. Um, if you haven't read the book yet, I, there's, there's a love story for both characters. Jeremy falls in love with a pigeon named Baby Mine. Um, you know, so I just, I really wanted to do that. And another thing that I show, and I'll, I'll stop with the pigeons, is um, the pigeon uh, family is really beautiful, I think. Like, I read this thing about how the pigeon couples are extremely egalitarian, and so there's always a, a mom and a dad, and they lay the eggs, and they take turns sitting on them, and then both the, the mother and the father produce pigeon milk, which is just in their crops, and they both feed the baby pigeons equally. And so I just, I, I knew all this stuff, Joan, and I just tried to like throw it in as much as I could in a way that would create a character that you would really care about. Um, so yeah, and my, my shout out goes to this book called um, The Pigeon, The Homing Pigeon by Edgar Chamberlain. And that guy writes about pigeons, you know, with I, like, we should all be so lucky as to be loved by someone the way that Edgar Chamberlain loves pigeons. Um, but there's another question um, from Eric Patner. He says, you've now had two encounters with Charles Middlesey's relatives. Can you talk about those? I can because one of them is here. Um, hello, John. John is, you know, I think we can see the name on the screen. Um, and so that story is, um, oh, somebody's in the waiting room. Okay. Um, so yeah, so my, my book is out now in Chicago's many fine independent bookstores, and John happened upon a copy that was in Pilsen Community Books. And naturally, as I think any of us would do, uh, when you see your name on a book, you, um, you're interested. And here's John. <laughs> Hello. Um, and John reached out to me over Facebook um, and let me know that he had seen the book. He had started the book and he was a relative of Charles Whittlesey. And he and I arranged just through the magic of the internet to meet back up at um, Pilsen Community Books. And I signed his copy and he gave me, he's a musician, a great musician, and gave me some of his music. So John, do you want to add anything in? Or I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you, do you want to chime in? Uh, well, I feel put on the spot, but that's okay. <laughs> I just think, I'm just glad you're having another, I'm attending another of your events. I feel very lucky and I'll just let you guys ask questions. Thank you, John. Um, um, and then I have another I want to jump in here. We're yeah. you're breaking up for some oh. reason. I'm not sure what's going on, but it's like very staticky, some sort of interference in the audio. I'm not quite sure why. I don't know if there's anything I can do about it. Okay, it's very weird. There's not much in my mind. Sorry, sorry, I ended up in a thing because we're almost in this movie. I'm afraid if I log out and log back in, I won't be able to get back in. Should I do that? Eric tells me to log out. Should I do that? Is it that bad? It's bad. Did she change her source of talking to us when she went from the pictures to the screen where she's talking? I have no idea how she how she was connecting, Catherine. Let's see if her if she can pop back in. Otherwise, maybe she can answer on the chat. So let's give her a couple minutes to try to log back in. Let's see if this works. She's rejoining. Hey, 
Is that better? That's way better. Hey, great. It's not actually um, normal. <laughs> great. I am so sorry. I had no idea. I hope that that wasn't going on forever. No, it was just, it just was a couple of minutes. So you're fine. Excellent. Um, we probably have time for like one more question, maybe. Well, totally I just true. want to point out that there is another connection between the Hasbrooks and Cliff Dwellers. So that makes a connection between Whittlesey and the Cliff Dwellers because, of course, yes. Will was, Will, Wilfred Hasbrook was, you know, a long time member, president. Charlie was, a, was president. So, yeah, I, it's interesting that, that that kind of cropped up and nobody really knew about it. This it's a small world. Happen. Yeah. yeah. These things happen. They do. I have a, I have a structure question. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I, when I opened, when I started the book and I saw the first line, the first line blew me away. Then I saw the first line was also the first line of the second chapter. When did you decide that the first sentence of each chapter alternating between the narrators would be the same line from such different perspectives? Yeah, great question. Um, I decided that early on, I agonize over my first sentence, as I think a, a lot of novelists probably do. Um, Martin and I are in a book club with a guy named Dale Panger, and he has the like Dale Panger first sentence test. And he says that the, the quality of a first sentence for him is judged by whether or not he reads it and has more than one question okay. as a result. And so I, I had Dale in my head as I was coming up with that first sentence. And then I think at that point, you know, monuments matter most to pigeons and so soldiers. Cool. I think once I got that as the first sentence, I knew early on that I needed to repeat it because it has it in there. It has the duality, right? Like pigeons and soldiers caring about the same thing in different ways. And I think at that point I was like, okay, I'm doing this all the way through like all 19 chapters. So and it really helped a lot. And let me just say, as a reader, it helped a lot. I didn't think it was sustainable. Yeah. After I saw it was, oh, chapter two and three, or th three and four, five and six, it's, this is going to happen every time. I didn't think it could be sustained, and it, it was, uh, organically, based on the two characters, the parallels and differences between them, the two worlds you're coming from. And as a cynical old reader, Whenever I'm like, ah, this ain't going to work, and it works, bang, you got me. Thank you so much. I'm glad it passed the, the Bill Savage <laughs> no, test. No, 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 that's only one of the many Bill Savage tests, but <laughs> I'm kind of yeah. a poor I'm like, I love first lines, last lines, and to set up a structure where you're going to do, these words are going to be the same for two different sets of narratives, that's a huge challenge. That's an amazing thing to pull off without it feeling mechanical. It never felt mechanical. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I love, you know, kind of ending on a structure question. And, you know, I think something I often get asked at these is like, how do I write and, you know, process stuff? And I'm definitely an outliner. I would never say that every novelist has to be an outliner, but personally, I cannot imagine writing a novel. I think I love all the genres, but I think novels are the hardest. They're, I love them, but they're so hard. And if I didn't outline, I don't think I could do it. I would just get out in the weeds, you know, and have to delete 500 pages. And so that target actually, I think, comes from, again, shout out to my poets who are here, um, my poetry background of like setting myself up a form, setting up a refrain, giving myself marks to hit as I kept going. And then I see Eric, <laughs> Eric has been to, I think, every single one of my events, which is like a record, <laughs> and he deserves like a star. Um, but he says, and so this is a callback to other events, so I'll end on this question. Um, if you couldn't be a pigeon or a whale, what animal would you be? Because I get asked what animal would I be if I could be an animal since I write as an animal. And so um, I say pigeon, of course, because I love pigeons. I say whale because Moby Dick is like the greatest novel of all time, and I, I love Moby Dick so much. Um, but I would be, I don't know, Eric, if you accept this as different enough from a whale, but I would be a dolphin. I would definitely be a dolphin because they're so smart and they're such good swimmers and they also kind of like humans. I don't know why all these animals, these really smart animals like us sometimes. I don't know if we deserve it, but they like us. So I guess there's something to us if dolphins like us, right? And pigeons like us. Um, 
but thank you. It's, it's 8.01 and I promised that this would be an hour. Um, so thank you so much, Joan, for having me. Thanks to the oh, Cliff Dwellers. Thank you for, I, this was just such a wonderful idea to do this and we are thrilled to have you back. And hopefully one of these days we'll be able to have you back in person. <laughs> yes, yes, I look forward to it. And thank you so much. And um, thanks to Barbara and David, uh, my in-laws down in Texas. Thanks for coming. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thank you, Kathy. Bye. Bye. Good night.